Please be seated. We're ready to hear argument in 2393 Miles versus the Texas Central Railroad and Infrastructure. Justice Bland is not participating in the decision in this case. Justice Lehrman and Justice Devine expect to, but can be present as well. Mr. Chief Justice, may it please the court. We can all agree that the defendants here are private companies who wish to bring high speed rail to Texas. We can also agree that the Texas legislature knows what uh, high speed rail is, but it has never granted the power of eminent domain to high speed rail companies. So, what the defendants here are trying to do is to shoehorn themselves into uh, two other and different modes of transportation that do have eminent domain. One is a railroad company under Section 81002, Subpart 2, and the other is an interurban electric railway company under Section 131001, 011, and 012. But the defendants cannot be both at the same time, and in fact, they're neither one under the plain meaning of the statutes. And bearing in mind that eminent domain statutes must be strictly construed and strictly complied with, I want to start first with the definition of a railroad company because that seems to be where they're focusing their attention at this point in time. A railroad company is a legal entity operating a railroad. The defendants are not that, certainly not conclusively as a matter of law for summary judgment purposes. The starting point is the common and ordinary meaning of those statutory terms. A railroad, commonly understood, is a system of tracks and trains running. Operating is the present participle, meaning causing something to work. So an entity operating a railroad is simply an entity uh, causing trains to run on tracks, very plain and simple. And it ensures that railroad companies with the power of eminent domain are real companies with experience and capital. And under that definition, how do you get to be one if you don't have eminent domain? I'm sorry, just said. How do you get to be one if you don't have eminent domain? Well, uh, a railroad company. It's a legal entity operating a railroad. It doesn't say in Texas you can be operating a railroad anywhere. In fact, uh, in the predecessor version of Section 8101, subpart 2, uh, in 6259A, it said a legal entity is a railroad company. Uh, a railroad company is a legal entity operating a railroad in this state. It no longer says in this state you can be operating a railroad anywhere. So today, Mr. Essinger, 112053 says uh, you, that a railroad company can acquire property to incorporate. Uh, so if, if you have to already have trains on tracks, then is that part of the statute just a nullity, or do we have to consider that as informing what a railroad company means? I, I don't think it's nullity at all. I think the easiest way to understand it is take, for example, SNCF, which is filed an amicus brief in this case, SNCF. Uh, has no trains or tracks in Texas. If it were to come to Texas, it would be a new company. And it may want to incorporate, it may want to do corporate business. But it is a is railroad it company. Incorporated? Sorry? Is it already incorporated? It, it, it may be somewhere else, but it may want to incorporate in Texas. Why? Well, I, I don't know, but, but it, it, it would have that option to do that. Anybody would. But the point is, it's, it's operating a railroad elsewhere. And that's what counts, and therefore it can come into Texas, exercise eminent domain to acquire the right of way needed for its first track in Texas. That's that's what they're concerned about. And because there's so many of these companies, there there are dozens and dozens of companies just like that that are operating a railroad. Um, there's no danger of a monopoly or an association of persons. Uh, the, the statute fits perfectly with that type of situation. We have an already operating railroad company. And under that definition, they're not operating a railroad. They weren't operating one at the time of incorporation. They're not, they weren't operating one at the time of, time of summary judgment. They're not operating one now. They're not likely to ever have operate one. They don't have tracks. They don't have trains. They don't have facilities. And frankly, they don't have money. They built a mile of tracks. Would that be enough? If they were to build a mile of tracks? <laughs> Hard to say, Justice Young, without knowing that. I would need to know. Uh, if it's a bona fide railroad, 
I would need to know if they're actually operating it. Uh, I think Denbury calls for more searching inquiry into, into the bona fides of the situation. And I think here it's telling that they've never done that, uh, which I think is a comment upon their lack of expertise and lack of money. But we, if we really adopted your argument, we're left to the possibility that if they build a mile, half a mile, and have some train that goes back and forth on it, that that's enough. We wouldn't we expect them to say, okay, fine, we'll build a mile of track. And now we satisfy the definition, at least. Right. Uh, I think we would have to know if it's a bona fide railroad. Bonafide being the words of a member, I would think we'd have to know if they're actually operating it. Uh, and until we, we know those things, I, I just can't speculate about the hypothetical because on this record they're not doing those things. So they have no prospect of doing so. I, I know you take the phrase bonafide from Denbury, but what do you, what do you mean when you say bonafide uh, member? Well, I'm, I'm reluctant to. As opposed to a non bonafide Right. Uh, you know, they weren't terribly clear about it in Denbury other than relying upon the statutory test or the statutory requirement of actually uh, uh, transporting oil to or for the public for hire. So here I would say bona fide in this context means a real railroad, you know, not some HO miniature train or something to that effect. I would say operating means actually running and causing trains to run on the tracks. Uh, and under those definitions, they're, they're not doing it and have no prospect of doing it. So what they try to do now is they're pivoting to a different definition, they're adding the words business slash enterprise to the end of railroad uh, based on the mistaken notion that uh, a railroad can be incorporated. Well, of course it can be incorporated, just like uh, an airline can be incorporated or a ship can be incorporated and a railroad can be incorporated. And their, their addition of the word enterprise and business create a couple of problems. First of all, they're just adding words to the statute that aren't there, and they're creating extreme circularity when they do that. To them, a railroad company means an entity operating a railroad enterprise business. Nobody knows what that means because it's entirely circular. And even then, it sets up a requirement that, that they can't meet because... Well, but doesn't 112053 give us some examples of what that means? Well, it doesn't use the word railroad enterprise or business, like incorporating or acquiring your first tracks for a right of way. Well, I think we need to start with the definition of a railroad company because 112053 begins by talking about what a railroad company is making sense of the things. Right, but if a railroad company can't do the things in 112053, then it's not a very good definition of what a railroad company is because the legislature says here are the things that a railroad company can do. It, it, what it's describing are, some, are, are the things a railroad company can exercise eminent domain to do. Right. And if it's not a railroad company, then that surplus, that part of 112053 is surplus. Well, not in the case of SNCF, which is operating a railroad elsewhere. Right. I, I, don't, I understand that. Okay. And uh, so we've been focusing on the second subpart under this railroad company uh, notion. Right. And what went over to, which is any other legal entity operating a railroad. Under the first subpart, a railroad incorporated before September 1st, 2007, under former Title 112, what is that? Like, what did it take for somebody to be that and to fall into that category? It's it's a little convoluted when you parse through the old Title 12, 112, but it's basically an incorporation requirement, and it said that if the if the entity did not have trains and tracks, it needed to partner with or contract with one that did. So it was more of an incorporation focus under the old one. They're relying upon that to say, well, a railroad can't incorporate, so we need to read in the words business and enterprise. And, and as I say, a railroad can incorporate, and you cannot read in the words business and enterprise. And, and they're not really, they're not even an enterprise. So, our, so you, could only be, you could only be a railroad incorporated before September 1st under former Title 112 if you had a relationship with somebody who was actually running trains? It, it, that's the way it reads, yes. Uh, so many words it says that if you don't have tracks and trains, you have to incorporate with one who does. I want to be sure you have a chance to address 131012. Uh, given that the current form of the statute was passed in 2009, why should we limit it to the type or speed of cars that were no longer around by that time? My argument is slightly different, Justice Buzzman. My argument is that this high speed rail uh, is nowhere mentioned in Chapter 131. But it's not, not mentioned either. It says 
purpose is constructing lines of electric railway between municipalities for transportation of freight or passengers. It seems like that applies here. Well, two answers. Number one is high-speed rail is different. It's defined in other statutes, section 111, 103. But the statute doesn't say anything about speed. It just says electric rail travel. We, we need to look at the whole context of Chapter 131. If there are a whole list of things we've talked about that, that an interurban can do, that a high-speed rail cannot do. And there's so many things that it cannot do that it's, that, that, that it's, it doesn't, it's not even that thing. Uh, they say, well, those are permissive things. We don't need to do those. But that's the point. They can't, they can't do those things. So, therefore, that's some uh, indication, some hint from the legislature, from the statute, that they're not the thing they purport to be. And that's why high speed rail is defined elsewhere uh, as something entirely different. So, I think for those reasons, and, and then I think we, importantly, we need to talk about the 1989 creation of the High Speed Rail Act, which created a special state agency to exercise eminent domain, which would have been entirely unnecessary if 131 already conferred eminent domain power upon private high-speed rail companies. So for those reasons, I think uh, high-speed rail is a public-private partnership, right, using state funds? Well, uh, not exactly. It, it involved a private high-speed rail franchise with the oversight of the state agency that was created to, to exercise the eminent domain on its behalf. My point is that would have, that whole very long act would have been entirely unnecessary if Section 131 already conveyed eminent domain power to private high speed rail companies. Except that the legislature could have thought it prudent, right? If, if public funds were being used to, to have a different economic environment. Well, pu public funds were more of a it was more of a guarantee situation. I mean, ultimately the money had to come from the, the private high speed rail entity, and that's why it failed. It just wasn't able to meet any of the milestones needed. So I, I think it was fundamentally a private enterprise, but eminent domain was conferred on the state agency. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Levenger. We'll hear from the state. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. With the Court's permission, I'd like just to begin by answering a few of the questions that I've heard the Court discussing so far. Um, Justice Busby, to speak directly to your question about 112.053a and why any corporation would essentially also reincorporate in Texas, there's a variety of international tax and, and assets bankruptcy reasons why you have very high capital international industries in the form of an operating company and then also an operating subsidiary in specific cross-border jurisdictional questions. It limits what assets can be claimed in the event of insolvency and it limits the exposure to corporate tax rates elsewhere. So to speak specifically about the example of a French company and the United States company, they have profoundly different tax regimes for purposes of value-added taxes and capital gains. What about a Delaware company versus a Texas company? At that point, it would be just the operating subsidiary for purposes of controlling liability, controlling assets across multiple stages. But it's easy to see an operating parent and an operating subsidiary needing to have 112053, even though they're operating the trade, say, in Delaware. You might have corporate parent A that actually, as a matter of fact, is registered in the Surface Transportation Board and is running trains in Delaware. They decide that they want to undertake the relatively difficult task of starting a new railroad line in Texas to open into the Texas market. They're entitled, the parent would be entitled to use eminent domain as an operating, as an entity operating a railroad, including for the purpose of incorporating the operating subsidiary. That's one, that is one interpretation of 112053 that both makes linguistic and corporate sense as a matter of this sort of practical description. Um, to turn to your question about former Title 112, uh, Justice Blacklock, there were a number of, it was a, a profoundly different requirement for purposes of being able to qualify as an incorporated railroad under old Title 112, which included, and this is, goes back to the 1876 original passage of this act, included that an entity had to be incorporated in Texas or it couldn't operate as a railroad corporation. It had a minimum capital uh, subscription requirements and minimum payment requirements to the actual stockholders of that capital. So it had, from the original 1876 statute, I believe a requirement of $1,000 per, per uh, initial capital share subscriber or something like that, which in 1876 is a profound monetary investment. One can see why the legislature would have these sort of two substitute ways of seeing whether or not a, a railroad company is likely enough to have a sort of productive enterprise to justify the extremely intrusive exercise of state power 
that comes with the eminent exercise of eminent domain by a private actor. And that's the reason for my question, is that if there were a lot of hoops you had to jump through to fall under subpart one to demonstrate your legitimacy, one might expect that subpart two would be interpreted similarly to require something more than mere corporate formation. I think that's right, Justice Blacklock, and I think the legislature in updating uh, Title I helped create a chapter 112, understood that because railroads are now mature technology, where as opposed to in 1876, they're sort of popping up everywhere and have many of them fail, the legislature would sensibly require that someone before exercising the highly disfavored practice of having an eminent domain be exercised by a private party might require the actual operation of real trains on real tracks. Now, to speak to Justice Young's point regarding what would be enough, a mile, half a mile, I think that would just be the ordinary sort of inquiry for a sham or for something sort of not fulfilling an actual statutory requirement, which is familiar to this court in a variety of contexts and familiar to lower courts. It would be fact-specific in any given context, but the question would be whether or not it's, it's a sham, essentially. If the person entity is actually operating a railroad, then they qualify, and that's the line the legislature drew ultimately. So they have to buy the property to do that. Respectfully, no, Your Honor. The operation requirement doesn't require ownership. There are other titles, for example, in Natural Resources Code that entitle an entity if they own, operate, or manage, for example, a pipeline to do so. Here, the legislature has made the key aspect the operation. So you could have operate ownership parent holding company A that works through operating subsidiary B. A owns the assets. B actually operates them in the real world. There's no ownership requirement of a train car, no ownership requirement of train tracks. There is an operation requirement, which, to use a linguistically similar example, it's the distinction between an operating a restaurant and sort of being a person who's the financier. When I were to say to you, uh, I'm a man operating a restaurant, to try and track the statutory language as closely as possible, you wouldn't think I was someone who is designing the restaurant concept and going to the bank for a loan, even though there's important preconditions. You'd think I went in, I turned the keys, I opened up the place, I chose the menu, I addressed the customers. I'm the person who does the real-world work of causing the core function of the enterprise to happen. That's the distinction here between sort of ownership and some of the initial capital formation steps that respondents appear to have taken and actually operating a railroad, which requires, at bottom, there must be a train somewhere that's, in fact, going from point A to point B with passengers or cargo as a result of the actual practical actions of respondents. I wanted to ask you about your inquiry argument. I don't understand the reason why it would be limited to private parties, because uh, inquiry doesn't seem to limit this reasonable probability requirement that the requirements of the statute are going to be met to private parties. The Constitution doesn't limit public use to private parties. Government Code Chapter 2206 is not limited to private parties. And the statutes that the government and private entities use for condemnations use similar terms, like necessary or required, and they specify certain uses or purposes. So if you're right about what Denbury means, then why shouldn't we equally ask if a county is condemning property or if the state or text dot or somebody like that, well, are they really going, is it really necessary, is it reasonably likely to be necessary for this project? And is it reasonably likely to actually be used for that use or purpose? The language is the same and the Constitution is the same, so why shouldn't the outcome be the same? Respectfully, Your Honor, and I don't want to push back against the hypo too much. We don't read Denbury as function that way. We read it as a question about the statutory requirements under a provision of the Natural Resource Code. Putting that aside entirely. So I, I'm just, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm positing to you is that the statutes that authorize government condemnation contain very similar requirements. Of course, Your Honor. So, for one, even, again, taking all this as given, the actual funding by the legislature for a project saying we'd like to build a highway from A to B and the legislature's statement we're committing to this and providing it with initial funding for it, as a matter of law, provides reasonable probabilities that the state is, in fact, going to execute the project that it's undertaken. What if it's a drainage district or a, a county or a, or a city that's not very well capitalized and, and they have the initial funds but they have to issue some bonds later on that the voters are going to have to approve in order to complete the project? No doubt, Your Honor, the test that we're advancing in Denbury taken that way will have some circumstances where if you have a highly distressed municipality or a highly distressed district where they might be required to raise additional capital before exercising eminent domain power as against the, as against the individual landowner. Undoubtedly, that would be the 
in the ordinary course, uh, in part because of the tax preferred treatment of some of these municipal and, and water bonds, it's not as difficult to get them exercised, except as a matter of political will by the voters of that of that jurisdiction. But at that point, this court doesn't have a problem to be worried about because all that means is if the voters of that jurisdiction aren't willing to actually commit the monetary capital requirements to the project, then the landowner shouldn't be required to bear the initial upfront cost of suffering imminent domain in order to make something the voters aren't really so technically interested in doing in the first place happen. I have just one other question along these with the lines of the Denver case. To answer it, I'd like to set aside Denver and just focus on the Constitution. What is what is the basis for finding a probable success requirement for completion of projects in the Constitution itself? Putting aside Denver altogether and interpreting what sort of start from first principles. Starting from first principles, to the extent that there is a requirement before the taking of property that's going to be for public use. There's a requirement there's actually, in fact, going to be a public use for the taking of the property. That presupposes the actual ultimate existence of the public work, whatever it might be. Ordinarily, that's not particularly challenged because when the government commits to performing some large public work, it may do so at cost overruns, it may do so at rates that, that one finds frustratingly slow, but it's very rare that you get a government commit to something like a superconducting super collider that gets through three quarters of the way they go, well, this is not for us anymore. It occasionally happens, and of course there's a giant blight out in Texas because of that particular project. But speaking just to the public use constitutional requirement, this court looked to see whether or not you have the ordinary indicia of a government commitment to a project, the ordinary commitment in the way these have been historically performed. I think the court would look to that to see if something irregular is happening. And Even though in Denbury we cited Harrington that the test is that the professed use must be a public one in truth to be a lawful taking, not that the professed use must actually happen. Again, Your Honor, I'm sort of I'm answering within the constraints that Justice Young provided me. We interpret Denver originally as a statutory interpretation question. Right, but Harrington is a constitutional takings case. So, and, and what we were picking up on is importing some of that into being sure that the statute was satisfied. And I agree with you about that. But, but it seems to me we were we were taking the use as a given and saying if this came to fruition, would it be a public use? Because that's what we had done in the constitutional. I think when the state is involved, specifically asking about what the state's public use requirements are, this court, as it does in a variety of other contexts, can lend much more credence to the commitment of the state, especially when that's reflected by the legislature in an appropriation or in a statement or in a law where it states its intentions or plans for a project. When there's a private party involved, the constitutional requirements can sort of become heightened or more suspect, precisely because it involves a delegation of eminent domain authority to a private party that doesn't have, as this court discussed, the public accountability and sort of public uh, the, the consequence of elections of individuals having to ultimately be accountable to the public. But we use the same sham uh, discussion that you used about with respect to whether or not there's a, a small railway that would qualify for that aspect. Could we use the same test if we, in the context of private entities using eminent domain authority, we really want to say we want to make sure public use requirement. That, that same language I think is in most state constitutions, the federal constitution, not just ours. Would that be sufficient to satisfy the constitutional requirement as opposed to a more likely than not judicial prediction of ultimate success completion? Just, is it a sham or not, just like with the railroad? So the sham inquiry is for, I was speaking specifically to transportation or to Code 81.002, talk about what would be what would be sufficient to comply that statute. Yes, I agree, but what I'm asking is would that same mode of analysis be sufficient to tell us whether or not something that purports to be a public use really is, if, if it's something that uh, is really a sham, that they've got some public thing that we can really identify that clearly is not going to be, be a public use, that would be su sufficient to satisfy the constitutional requirement, which I think would be a lower standard than actually trying to assess in, in, at this point in time whether however many years or decades later it will actually work. Would, would, would that be something that you think would satisfy the constitutional issue that you identified, which is we need to make sure it really is a public use. That strikes me as likely correct. I'd have to think about it a little more. That strikes me as right. I also think that would align well with the government code's restriction on the exercise of state eminent domain authority that must not be, in essence, to confer a private benefit upon a private party. I think those two things would largely align because if we're thinking of a sham public use, I would expect that normal sham would be a circumstance where the state is trying to secretly prefer ownership by one entity or help them get some sort of rents that would be inappropriate otherwise. Any other questions? Thank you, Jim.
And therefore, they respond. Yeah, please support. Ms. Yates will present argument for the respondents. Thank you, Your Honor. Marie Yates for Texas Central. Your Honors, our opponents are misinterpreting the Transportation Code's plain language when they say that Texas Central cannot be a railroad company with survey and condemnation authority unless we already have trains on tracks. I'd like to start with Texas Transportation Code Provision 112053, which is the one that Justice Lesby points to on that tab one of my poster book. This is the provision that gives a railroad company condemnation authority for any of the following purposes, and then it lists a bunch of purposes. And one of those purposes, number five, is for the right-of-way or new or additional right-of-way. Now, statutory interpretation tells us we have to give meaning to each one of those words, and that means the right-of-way has to mean something different from new or additional right-of-way. So the right-of-way must be the very first track, and new or additional right-of-way is new track. So this provision says a railroad company can condemn to build the very first track. So where are our opponents getting this argument that a railroad company has to already have trains on tracks? They're misreading Section 81.002's definition of a railroad company. That is tab two of my book. The dictionary does define railroad as a train on track. Okay, but this court said in the Kadena case, which the SG cites, that you don't go use the dictionary definition if context of the statute tells you otherwise. So look at the context of this statute. Justice Blacklock referred to this. Look at the first subpart, a railroad incorporated. Counsel keeps saying a railroad can incorporate. Well, if he's right and railroad means trains on tracks, he's saying trains on tracks can go incorporate. What did it take to become a railroad incorporated before September 1st under former Title 112? There, there were, under the prior provision, Title 112, that counsel refers to, there were a number of requirements. But the purpose of and the so, other... And so why wouldn't, if, if subpart one entails some indicia of legitimacy connection to an actually operating railroad, other hoops that you had to jump through, it would seem natural to interpret subpart two as entailing you know, something other than just filing a paper with the Secretary of State that says, I want to run a railroad. Right. Well, I'm, but I'm making so, your point, I think, Your Honor, that you read the two subparts together, right? Well, I'm suggesting that if, if subpart one is, is requires indicia of legitimacy and actual operation, wouldn't you expect subpart two to be in the same vein? Perhaps. Or, or, else, or else wouldn't subpart two just swallow everything and subpart one doesn't matter anymore if subpart two is as broad as you? So but that just doesn't that just kind of beg the question, Your Honor, that they're saying that subpart one says you have to have additional requirements. What subpart one is doing is we're defining a railroad company, and it's defining a railroad company as somebody incorporated before this date under that title. The purpose of adding subpart two was to allow you to also incorporate under the Business Corporations Act. So you could decide to incorporate under Title 112 and be regulated as a railroad company under 112. Or you could also be a railroad company under 112 if you incorporated under the Business Corporations Act. That's the only purpose of Subpart 2. And the reason that I'm bringing up Subpart 2, and I think Your Honor is on to a good point here, is that if you read these two provisions together, the two subparts together, as statutory interpretation would tell you to do, the word railroad in Subpart 1 does not mean trains on tracks, because trains on tracks cannot incorporate only an enterprise can incorporate. So the word railroad in subpart one means a railroad enterprise. And so what does the word railroad and enterprise in subpart two mean? A railroad enterprise. The, the is, is anything required other than formation of, a, of an entity under, that describes itself as a to build a railroad? You have, under subpart two, you would be a legal entity operating, we say, a railroad enterprise. And, that the con and we are operating a railroad. If you want to talk about sham justice, no. Well, no but, but is, what's required other than formation of the entity that, that describes you itself as having the intention of doing All right, this. you have to be operating a railroad enterprise. Okay? We are clearly, conclusively on the summary judgment evidence operating a railroad enterprise. What it does not say is that you have to be already operating trains on tracks. And that's what our opponents want it to mean. 
And we're saying it is an honor. What if, what if I, uh, I decide that I want to build a train between my house and the, my neighbor's house down the road, and the two of us incorporate, and we raise a lot of money, and we are ready to go, and we are going to build this train. Mm -hmm. The problem is there are half a dozen houses in between. But that's not a problem because we've incorporated it as a railroad and we're going to take right. those houses. Why, why can't we do that? Because it wouldn't satisfy the public use requirement that Justice Busby was talking about. The Constitution well, let's, let's, say gonna, let's say I've got a big piece of property. I'm going to build a park and I'm going to buy uh, schools are going to come visit and my neighbor's going to do the same thing and kids are going to ride back and forth between the two and we're going to sell tickets and, you know, we're going to do all kinds of things. The condemnation authority under this statute for a railroad company is to operate a railroad enterprise, not to operate a park. So the railroad would have to be for public use. And by the way, under the Constitution, railroads are automatically common carriers. There is no public use here. It's undisputed that this train is going to carry the public between Dallas and Houston. But your example, Your Honor, would not be having the railroad be for public use. Well, but look, let's expand it by it's, it's going from uh, the city of Westlake to the city of Rollingwood. Okay. And there, you know, there's a little bit of space in between, but I think a lot of people have been riding. We're going to sell tickets. So now, now it's an interurban railway. That's right. Is, are there any restrictions on this? If, if people just incorporate and say, I want to build a railroad, I'm going to sell tickets, I want the public to use it, and I'm, I'm just going to you would take everything I need for it. What, what, what restrictions the, exist? You would meet the requirements of the statute. If the landowner comes in and says, oh, it's a sham, as Justice Young suggests, you would have to come forward and prove you're not a sham. But, Your Honor, on this record, Texas Central is not a sham. Look at everything we say. We send this booklet twice about all the different, here, tab 12, all the different things that Texas Central is doing and has done, the hundreds of millions of dollars that we've already spent. See, it's a progression to get a railroad built. You have to start with the regulatory approvals. And that's what Texas Central has been doing so far with the hundreds of millions of private investment money that's already been put into this to trigger the regulatory activity by the Federal Railroad Administration, which has studied the train for years, selected the route, written a 5,000-page environmental impact statement, written rules, safety rules for this train, takes up thousands of pages in the Federal Register. The Federal Surface Transportation Board has taken jurisdiction over this train and says it's a rail carrier. This is the real thing. This is not a sham. And well, we all we have to do for this statute is to be operating a railroad enterprise, not we, trains on tracks. Don't under, we have to use under Denbury, uh, look at specific things in the statute that are reasonably likely to happen or not? So, for example, in the interurban railway statute, for the purpose of that, going back to Justice Blacklock's example, for the purpose of constructing lines of electric railway between municipalities for the transportation of freight or passengers. Right. So I suppose the inquiry in his case, would, uh, his hypothetical between Rollingwood and, and Westlake would be, is it reasonably likely that it built it would actually be for the transportation of freight or passengers as a common carrier? Is that well, look, the statute... To tether, to use the inquiry to tether to the language right. of the statute. But see, that's a big, that's a big expansion from Denbury, isn't it? Because Denbury is only dealing with the constitutional and the statutory requirement for public use as opposed to private use. For well, Denbury was dealing with common carrier in the statute, right. which right. we said was animated by the, uh, by the constitutional provision. But even if we say, well, Denbury is going to apply to all, everything in the transportation, you know, everything in the, that's in the statute right. has to be reasonably likely to happen. It seems like the inquiry under 131.012 would be, if it's built, are you actually going to transport freight or passengers as a common carrier or not? Is it reasonably likely to be built? That's the Denbury question. Denbury wasn't going to whether it's reasonably likely to be built. This is our opponents trying to take Denbury and take it somewhere where this court has never gone before. Right. And shouldn't we just look at what the statute says and see if there's a requirement in the statute that it's reasonably likely to be built? Yes. That's what, instead of, instead of embroidering onto the statute, because when the legislature grants certain categories of private condemnors like railroads, utilities. If it grants them condemnation authority, it's balancing the interests of the public and the infrastructure project and the private landowner whose land is needed. And what they're really asking this court to do is re-alter. Let's alter that balance 
And if you do that, you're going to deprive Texas here of all the benefits of this railroad. Let's assume, though, just for the moment, that we don't say you have to have trains already running on tracks, but that we do say you must show that reasonable probability of operating a railroad in the future. Right. What do you have to, to satisfy that? Well, uh, we would say that this record demonstrates that Texas Central's entities have done everything that a reasonable railroad company or a reasonable interurban railroad company would do at this stage of development to bring the high-speed train to reality. Right? If you look at everything we've done on surveying 2,000 tracks, signing survey permits 4,000, getting the federal government to do everything it needed to do for these regulatory permits, we've, we've taken it where we can get to this point. But they say, the SG says, oh, you have to have all the funding up front. Think about what private investor is going to fund this whole thing when we're before this court and whether we have eminent domain authority. We need the ruling from this court that we have eminent domain authority to get full funding. Now, we're, and we're eligible for federal infrastructure funding. That's what the environmental impact statement says. We're eligible for that. Hundreds of millions have already been invested. And we've done all the things that a reasonable railroad company would do. And we're undisputedly not a sham. And if you look at Denbury, look at the test that the court adopted in Denbury 2, it's a pretty low threshold test. Right? Is it reasonably likely that sometime after construction, at least one member of the public will use the pipeline? That's the test from Denbury 2. And I think it's such a low threshold test in part because the court doesn't want to have rules that chill public infrastructure projects. Okay? Is tech stock going to have to come in and prove well, it? Has all you have to show is reasonable likelihood that one member of the public will use it. Then, then why doesn't my little train between me and my neighbor's house? Satisfied that that is a pretty low standard. Uh, that's a different question, Your Honor. If you think your little train might satisfy the public use requirement, have at it. But well, I don't. Well, but it's important. It's, the, the reason I ask the question is because, you know, notwithstanding all the facts about this railroad and how you know how it's done a lot to get itself up and running and, right. and invested all this money, the, the rule that you're asking for, I'm concerned that the rule you're asking for opens this up to all kinds of uses that uh, if the threshold is very, very low to get, you know, to get in the door and become a railroad, there's then, a, then the potential for all abuse. kinds of takings that we can all imagine are, okay. are there. There's a common law principle of an arbitrary, capricious, or fraudulent taking. When a condemnation petition is filed, the landowner can come in and say, this is arbitrary and capricious. All he's trying to do is connect his property to his neighbor's property. That's how you would challenge that. But that doesn't mean you would dramatically change Texas condemnation law to overlay this requirement for a reasonable likelihood of completion. It's not in the Constitution. It's not in the well, statute. I'm, whether, I'm wondering not whether we would impose some sort of reasonable likelihood test that's got more teeth, but whether we would interpret this statute to be more limiting than we interpret it to be because we're concerned about the constitutional implications of opening this up to just anybody. All right, well, let me suggest this. Operating a railroad enterprise, if you go with me on the language of the statute, that that really means operating railroad enterprise, then you can go to Justice Young's point, like Denberry, and say, is it a sham? Are you really operating a railroad business enterprise? Yes. Yes, we look at everything we've already done. We're doing everything that in the progression of getting this train built that we could do at this point. And the financing, by the way, will be vetted through the regulatory authorities. The Surface Transportation Board is going to vet financing before they give us a certificate of convenience and necessity. So there's no need for this court to embroider on the statutes requirements that are not there, that have never been in Texas condemnation law. And by the way, I think the SG is wrong. If these requirements are in, you know, required under the Constitution, surely the public condonor would have to satisfy them too. So is TxDOT going to have to prove before they can start a 10-year highway project that, oh, by the way, the legislature is going to appropriate the money every year for 10 years? Look at the Harris County Commissioner amicus brief they filed yesterday where they say, huh, you know, in Harris County, we start these projects. We don't have all the funding up front. You know, and so for, that's really where they're going. They're trying to say that we have to have all the funding up front, but that's not practical. It's not practical for public condemnors, and it's not practical for when you're trying to do it with private investment. I don't know if you say you have to have all the funding up front, or at least that's not the quote as I understand it, but the idea of if the test is 
benefit every segment of society, environmental benefits, but we're just going to throw all that away under a statutory interpretation that we believe is wrong, just wrong-headed, because the word railroad in that statute doesn't mean choo-choo trains. It means the enterprise. Temporary reasonable likelihood standard. I think the record here shows you raise like around four hundred fifty million, and that the total cost is going to be thirty billion. Right. And uh, their argument is that's uh, that proves or at least creates a fact issue on whether right. there's a reasonable likelihood that you're going to win only four hundred raise four hundred fifty out of thirty. What I'm curious about is, at what point does evidence like that create a fact issue right. that a jury has to decide, as opposed to courts? Or will courts always decide reasonableness right. on that issue? And if so, what a jury or court, how do we use those numbers to figure out reasonableness? Okay, Justice Boyd, that's just Denbury has nothing to do with the reasonable likelihood of the project getting completed. Nothing. Denbury deals with whether it's public, the pipeline was, I argued Denbury too, the pipeline was for public use, or really it was for use by that pipeline company's affiliates. It was really for private use. That's all Denbury is about, a reasonable likelihood that the public will use the project. That's not an well, issue if, here. If they prove there's no reasonable likelihood that the project's ever going to be finished, then haven't they proved that there's no reasonable likelihood that the public's ever going to use it? That, we thought about that. That is not the way that the public use requirement has ever been viewed in condemnation law, either in the U.S. Supreme Court cases or this case. That's a new one to say, oh, wait a minute, public use really includes are you going to be able to finish building the project, which has never been a requirement of condemnation law. That's why they're asking you to dramatically change condemnation law and ask yourself how many public infrastructure projects, hospitals, railroads, roads, will not get built. If you adopt a reasonable likelihood of completion test and say, oh, the Constitution requires that, so public and private condemnors are going to have to prove that. And it's not reasonable, as I've tried to explain for this train, we couldn't even get all the financing when they're contesting our condemnation authority. We have to get that settled because we have major interest here from big players in the world rail system market, but they're waiting to see if you're going to affirm our condemnation authority. So, I ask you about the interurban railway. Let's go talk about that definition. On whether or not you satisfy that, the Delta Troy and Memphis brief has a that. And they, they make, I guess, two points. I want to hear your reaction first. We need to figure out what that term meant in 1907. Right. Originalism. Originalism, potentially. Right. That would be, so let's just pause there. Do you, do you agree or disagree that the only legitimate method of us interpreting that? is what an ordinary person would have understood it to mean in my search. Subject to newly developed technology. What about the fact that it was reenacted in 2009? That that statute was reenacted in 2009. How does that change the analysis? I don't think it changes it at all. Why not? Why, Why wouldn't the legislature be contemplating technologies in 2009 then rather than in because the, the legislative provision, and we haven't put it up, it's 133 point blah blah, expressly applies to high speed train because what is it? It's operating, constructing, and operating an electric railway between municipalities. And it's undisputed that this high speed train is an electric railway between municipalities. This is even stronger than your San Antonio Rail versus Southwestern Telephone case, where you had to take the condemnation statute that said telegraph and say, oh, don't worry, we'll just apply that to telephone. This statute on its face would expressly include this high-speed train. You don't have to change any verbiage. That's why the legislature didn't have to change anything. And the high-speed rail act, that's a public-private partnership, and the, the legislature decided we're not going to do it that way. But they never amended this statute or took it off the books. And so, of course, this is a high-speed train, uh, train that meets the electric railway requirement. And Justice Young, on originalism, it meets the plain language of the statute as it would have been understood when it was enacted, subject to later developed technology. And the amicus brief filed yesterday by the Greater Houston Partnership and Scott Keller's brief from the Dallas Chamber of Commerce, they're both great on this point. They, they cite the U.S. Supreme Court cases where Justice Scalia wrote 
okay, it's a search and seizure, and I know they weren't thinking about ray guns, so you do heat treatment to see if the people are inside, but that would be covered because you consider later developed technology. It's still a search and seizure. Same thing. This is still an electric railway between municipalities. Just because it's high speed doesn't mean that it's not covered. That's what this court would hold under your Southwest Railway case, and that's what originalists would tell you. But your, your, your argument, that, I don't want to make sure I'm understanding it, is that this really is just Kylo versus the United States. And yes, the absolutely. The framers are going to say, look, we, we, you know, if, 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 if the framers had been told that someday there would be a, an invention that would allow us to see what he's saying, when, when the lady of the house is drawing her bath, you know, mm-hmm. we're, they all, well, yes, you can't, you can't and use some that's natural a church. thing. Exactly. And you're saying that this is exactly the same, that every statutory requirement, such that in 1907, if the people of Texas had been told that one day a sheep on sand could be brought here, well, yes, that that satisfies what we mean by interurban railroad. Right, exactly. Exactly. And if I could just make one more, I'm almost at the but if I could make one more point about the statutory interpretation, it's not just the statute that Justice Busby refers to. Look at 199.002, which is the definition of railroad, in the Transportation Code, it defines a railroad as an enterprise and distinguishes between the word enterprise and fixed track. And there you have the scalia Carter treatise talks about the canon of consistent usage in a code. Well, the word railroad here in this code consistently used to mean a railroad business enterprise. So we're not adding words. We're doing proper statutory interpretation on what does the word railroad mean. And it doesn't mean trains on tracks. It means a railroad enterprise, which is only an enterprise can apply. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Yates. Thank you. Mr. Levinger, we have about five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. I first want to push back on the enterprise, and then I want to push back on Denver. On the enterprise, they're clearly adding words that the legislature didn't include, and they're asking you to accept their own ips and dixit that they're even uh, performing a railroad enterprise when all they're doing are basic preliminary activities that don't come anywhere close to operating a railroad that's going to involve billions and billions of dollars, $30 billion to be exact. They talk about what they've done with the FRA. Let's be clear, the FRA itself said, we don't grant any kind of construction approval or permit, neither does this final rule by itself grant any permission or authority uh, for TCRR to operate. So that it doesn't mean a thing. The Surface Transportation Board denied their request to be exempt from the application process. They have to file an application because the Surface Transportation Board had concerns about their financial feasibility. That was 18 months ago. Have they filed an application? No. Why not? Because it would require them to disclose their existing finances and their prospects of ever raising additional money. They cannot do that and will not do that. And that's why on this summary judgment record, they have maybe they're waiting, waiting on our decision. I, I, they have much deeper problems than that, Justice Busby. They've got serious financial issues uh, that prevent them from coming anywhere close to raising or de- demonstrating where they're going to get the 18 to $30 billion needed for this project. And remember, this is on summary judgment. They have not conclusively established as a matter of law that they are operating or even that they will be operating. And that takes me to Denver. To be very clear, Denver... Before, before you get there, can I just ask, what did Ms. Yates say that was wrong about the idea that a railroad track or train car tracks can be moved in the form? You, you said, well, yeah, no problem. The, the, the railroad, the, the, the thing itself can move somewhere that needs to be in the ground. What did she say that was wrong? Well, I think what she said is, <clears throat> again, it's almost ips and dicks that a railroad can't be incorporated. To which I say, of course a railroad can be incorporated. Airline can be incorporated, a ship can be incorporated. Are all enterprises that might own those things that are incorporated? They, they can incorporate them too, but I think you can incorporate an asset. So I think this, this effort to read in words that aren't there and create circularity, I think is wrong headed. Um, I want to be clear about Denver. Denver comes into play in this case in really only two ways. One is if you agree with their view that operating a railroad means we'll be operating a railroad. Then you get into Denver, and what Denver says is you determine whether there's a reasonable probability that the condom door will meet the statutory requirement, whatever it may be. So in that particular case, it was a natural resource code. They had to show a reasonable probability that they would be transporting the gas to or for the public for hire, which on remand they were able to meet with 
evidence of, of an objective contract with a third party. With a railroad, you need to show a reasonable probability that you will be operating. With an interurban, and, and you, would get to, you would get to it on the interurban only if you were to conclude that high-speed rail is an interurban, which I strongly disagree with, given the use of high-speed rail in other parts of the statute, but not in Chapter 131. But if you were to agree that high-speed rail uh, is an interurban, then the Denver test comes into play, because certainly just merely charting it is not enough. That's box checking. Okay, but if that's true, then why wouldn't the inquiry under Denbury be would the railway, if constructed, actually be for the purpose of transporting passengers between municipalities? I think to be more precise, under 131.01.1 and 012, it would have to be a reasonable probability that they will be conducting and operating. Those are the words in 131.01.1, conducting and operating an electric railway between two municipalities. And that gets us back to the same problem we have on this summary judgment record. Where, where does it say conducting and operating? For the purpose of constructing lines of electric railway between municipalities for the transportation of freight or passengers. I think you're reading 131.012. I was condemnation authority. Right, and I was talking about the definition of, of an interurban 131.011. Either way, though, I would say that they need to prove that, that, that they were actually able to take the words of 131012, actually able to construct, acquire, operate. The word operate is in 131012. And again, on this summary judgment record, they haven't conclusively established as a matter of law that they will be, if that's the test, uh, that they will be constructing, acquiring, operating, conducting, whatever uh, participle you want to use. You put about summary judgment at the trial. Yes. Is this a, at this stage before us, is this a summary judgment record case one way or the other, which the remand possibly? I, I, I thought about that before you, you asked the question, and I think certainly it, it's not a rendition in their favor. But in terms of ours, we didn't create a summary judgment record on the, on the will be on the reasonable probability test because they didn't bring that in until later. What we simply showed was that they're not a railroad company and they're not an interurban as a matter of law. So in that sense, summary judgment would be appropriate for us. If you have to get into the reasonable probability test, it probably is a fact issue. But I would point to this one piece of evidence. Everybody stipulated that only $125 million had been spent as of August of 2018. Given the more money they claimed to have spent over the last three years, there's no evidence of that. That is a fraction fraction of the 18 to 30 billion needed to uh, to operate this project, to build a If we give you, uh, we're in a situation where someone is, is able to satisfy the standard of showing the, the reasonable possibility that ultimately can come up, and then five years later, the funding dries up and it looks like, gosh, I don't think they're actually going to be able to put, we thought they, they would, but they got past the 50% mark on that one. Ouch, things look kind of different. Kind of, can you reinstitute? Proceeding. How does that how does that work exactly with the funding condition changes? Yeah, um, I can only look to Denver for guidance on that one. In that case, there was such a long period of time between the the original motion, cross motions for summary judgment, and the remand from this court that by that time the pipeline had been built, and they actually did have in place a, a contract with a third party uh, to carry the gas. Now, if this court were to remand for a determination of is there a reasonable probability that they'll be meeting the statutory requirements, we'll have a trial on it based on that existing set of facts. And if they can come up with a commitment, which they won't be, uh, to show that $30 million, the $30 billion is a certainty, that might be a stronger case. But on this current record, they're not even a fraction of could a jury reach different conclusions on that in different counties and at different times? Well, would there be collateral estoppel consequences? I mean, if it's determined... Well, well maybe not if the facts have changed, right? I mean, if, if just because you're not reasonably likely at point in time A, does that stop you from establishing that you are reasonably likely at point in time B? It, it, it may not. It, it, you know, collateral estoppel is sort of a valuable creature. So is the, so is the law of case. Well, that, that may be a problem with the test that we're being asked to adopt, is what I'm 
Well, as I say, that's that's not even our primary argument. We get we get to the reasonable probability test only if you were to conclude that operating railroad means will be operating railroad, which is their second argument, and only if you were to conclude that high speed rail is an interurban, then we get into the reasonable probability test. And well, unless we apply it like Denbury did and like our our constitutional tests have been, which assume that the project is going to be built and say, if so, does it fulfill the statutory that's what we did in Harrington. That's what we did in Denver. And it, and it depends upon the statutory requirement. Right. You know, in, in Denver, it was relatively easy because it was, are they transporting to or for the public for hire? Here it's a more difficult standard, as it ought to be for a railroad, which is a far more intrusive device running through people's property. In this case, it'd be 40-foot high embankments with 100-foot right-of-way and no grade crossing. So, yes, it is a higher standard that we need to be satisfied. Any other questions? I just want to know. Uh, you started off the argument by, by invoking the, the higher standard, the more demanding standard for eminent domain statutes. We have to, to construe them with a greater degree of, of rigor. And so my, my questions are, to, to what extent do you think you need that more rigorous standard here? And, and, and secondly, does that apply to statutes that just define what a railroad company is that, that may or may have applications wholly outside of eminent domain. I wonder if you could just give me that. I, I, I think, the, I think the, the doctrines apply whenever you're dealing with an eminent domain statute that delegates power to a private entity. And in this case, of course, the threshold is, are they a railroad company? So, so you said a private entity, but don't the same doctrines apply to the state? We've said that time and again. And, and there's nothing in the Constitution or any of the statutes that suggests that this applies any differently. And I dare say your clients would object if the state came in to take their property for something that wasn't actually going to happen, right? I think with the state, it's, it's public use requirements. And uh, in the case of well, Irish County, it, it, on, uh, if you look at Transportation Code 203051 and 2, for example, uh, governing text dots, require, uh, ability to acquire property by eminent domain. It has to be necessary to, for a state highway to be constructed or maintained. So if you apply Denbury to that, you would have to show, well, it's actually going to be constructed. Uh, and, and this is actually necessary for that. Well, I don't know that you do apply Denbury to that. Why? But why? Well, because it's in the statute. Well, it, if, if it's in the statute and if Denbury can be read to apply to public entities, why, why couldn't it? Then, then the test would be is a reasonable probability that it will be necessary. And, uh, and it, I think ultimately it boils down to the public use. That's the case of uh, uh, Harris County versus Kerr, where the big debate was, was there public use? Yeah, but I think what, what you're saying here is you have to see whether the statutory requirements, and it, it may not be exactly the same as public use, are reasonably likely to be met. Right, and I haven't canvassed all the statutes that apply to public entities. There are a lot of them, and I think necessary use is probably a common thread in many of them. Necessary is a reason that, yeah, and actually also prescribing specific types of uses that they can take property for. Yeah. Well, if, if you were to apply, if you were to apply Denver, and of course I don't think you need to decide that in this case, but if you were to apply that in that situation, it is not a high bar uh, for the state to show that it's, it's necessary. Uh, it's a much higher bar in this case as it should be in the case of a private railroad company or a high-speed rail coming in to try to take swaths of property to put up a 40-foot embankment, 100-foot right-of-way. Can you go back to my questions uh, uh, for, for a moment just for, for the end? Is, is it necessary for you to have that higher standard that you began by arguing? I, I think, I don't know that it's necessary, but I think the, the arguments that they've made that have changed over time pivoted from one position to another, and they argue, well, if you don't believe we're a railroad, then we're, we're an interurban. I think their own arguments demonstrate why they should lose, because the law is, if there's any doubt, then you construe the statute in favor of the landowner against the common law. Which section 881 is in the general provisions of Title V about railroads. Is it possible that if we subject section 81.002 to a heightened standard, just because it happens to be applied? In a, an eminent domain situation, that we would be risking a, a statute that has multiple applications in non eminent domain context to different interpretations. Just the, the Texas law means what it means, right? And you, you would agree right. with that. 
it makes sense for us to have a different standard of rigor of interpreting a statute, of a single statute that just exists based on what kind of case that it applies to. Well, you know, the case law that talks about strict construction, strict compliance, basically says it has to be a clear case that it falls within that statute. The eminent domain statute here with respect to the railroad company is 112.051.053. The predicate is that it's a railroad company. So we have to go back to that definition, and I think we do need to apply strict construction and strict compliance to that. Even if it risks inconsistent outcomes, sometimes something is a railroad company in some context, so we don't give it a strict standard of reading of 81.42, but in other cases it's not, just because the context of that particular litigation. Well, I don't know that there would be a great risk in this case, because if they're operating a railroad to meet the definition of a railroad company, in the way I say they should be operating a railroad, then I don't think it creates any risk. But if there is, just in theory, is it your position that it's worth it to do it because of the absolute private property right that is so fundamental to the Constitution that it's okay for there to be conditions? Yes. You know, if in doubt, we can screw it in favor of the landowner against the government. So, yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Your Honor. The case is submitted, and the court will take a vote.